Section 10 of All of Grace by Charles Spurgeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. How Repentance is Given To return to the grand text, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a saviour, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Our Lord Jesus Christ has gone up that grace may come down. His glory is employed to give greater currency to his grace. The Lord has not taken a step upward, except with the design of bearing believing sinners upward with him. He is exalted to give repentance, and this we shall see if we remember a few great truths. The work which our Lord Jesus has done has made repentance possible, available, and acceptable. The law makes no mention of repentance, but says plainly, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. If the Lord Jesus had not died and risen again and gone unto the Father, what would your repenting or mine be worth? We might feel remorse with its horrors, but never repentance with its hopes. Repentance, as a natural feeling, is a common duty deserving no great praise. Indeed, it is so generally mingled with a selfish fear of punishment that the kindliest esteem makes but little of it had not jesus interposed and wrought out a wealth of merit our tears of repentance would have been so much water spilled upon the ground jesus is exalted on high that through the virtue of his intercession repentance may have a place before god in this respect he gives us repentance because he puts repentance into a position of acceptance which otherwise it could never have occupied when Jesus was exalted on high, the Spirit of God was poured out to work in us all needful graces. The Holy Ghost creates repentance in us by supernaturally renewing our nature, and taking away the heart of stone out of our flesh. Oh, sit not down straining those eyes of yours to fetch out impossible tears. Repentance comes not from unwilling nature, but from free and sovereign grace. Get not to your chamber to smite your breast in order to fetch from a heart of stone feelings which are not there. But go to Calvary, and see how Jesus died. Look upward to the hills whence comes your help. The Holy Ghost has come on purpose, that he may overshadow men's spirits, and breed repentance within them, even as once he brooded over chaos and brought forth order. Breathe your prayer to him. Blessed Spirit, dwell with me. Make me tender and lowly of heart, that I may hate sin and unfeignedly repent of it. He will hear your cry and answer you. Remember, too, that when our Lord Jesus was exalted, he not only gave us repentance by sending forth the Holy Spirit, but by consecrating all the works of nature and of providence to the great ends of our salvation, so that any one of them may call us to repentance, whether it crow like Peter's cock, or shake the prison like the jailer's earthquake. From the right hand of God our Lord Jesus rules all things here below, and makes them work together for the salvation of his redeemed. He uses both bitters and sweets, trials and joys, that he may produce in sinners a better mind toward their God. Be thankful for the providence which has made you poor, or sick, or sad, for by all this Jesus works the life of your spirit and turns you to himself. The Lord's mercy often rides to the door of our hearts on the black horse of affliction. Jesus uses the whole range of our experience to wean us from earth and woo us to heaven. Christ is exalted to the throne of heaven and earth in order that, by all the processes of his providence, he may subdue hard hearts unto the gracious softening of repentance. Besides, he is at work at this hour by all his whispers in the conscience, by his inspired book, by those of us who speak out of that book, and by praying friends and earnest hearts. He can send a word to you which will strike your rocky heart as with the rod of Moses, and cause streams of repentance to flow forth. He can bring to your mind some heart-breaking text out of Holy Scripture which shall conquer you right speedily. He can mysteriously soften you, and cause a holy frame of mind to steal over you when you least look for it. Be sure of this, that he who is gone into his glory, raised into all the splendor and majesty of God, 
has abundant ways of working repentance in those to whom he grants forgiveness. He is even now waiting to give repentance to you. Ask him for it at once. Observe with much comfort that the Lord Jesus Christ gives this repentance to the most unlikely people in the world. He is exalted to give repentance to Israel. To Israel. In the days when the apostles thus spoke, Israel was the nation which had most grossly sinned against light and love, by daring to say, His blood be on us and on our children. Yet Jesus is exalted to give them repentance. What a marvel of grace! If you have been brought up in the brightest of Christian light, and yet have rejected it, there is still hope. If you have sinned against conscience, and against the Holy Spirit, and against the love of Jesus, yet there is space for repentance. Though you may be as hard as unbelieving Israel of old, softening may yet come to you, since Jesus is exalted, and clothed with boundless power. For those who went the furthest in iniquity, and sinned with special aggravation, the Lord Jesus is exalted to give to them repentance and forgiveness of sins. Happy am I to have so full a gospel to proclaim. Happy are you to be allowed to read it. The hearts of the children of Israel had grown hard as an adamant stone. Luther used to think it impossible to convert a Jew. We are far from agreeing with him, and yet we must admit that the seed of Israel have been exceedingly obstinate in their rejection of the Saviour during these many centuries. Truly did the Lord say, Israel would none of me. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Yet, on behalf of Israel, our Lord Jesus is exalted for the giving of repentance and remission. Probably my reader is a Gentile, but yet he may have a very stubborn heart, which has stood out against the Lord Jesus for many years. Yet in him our Lord can work repentance. It may be that you will yet feel compelled to write as William Hone did when he yielded to divine love. He was the author of those most entertaining volumes called The Everyday Book, but he was once a stout-hearted infidel, when subdued by sovereign grace, he wrote, The proudest heart that ever beat hath been subdued in me. The wildest will that ever rose to scorn thy cause and aid thy foes is quelled, my lord, by thee. Thy will, and not my own, be done. My heart be ever thine, confessing thee the mighty word, my Saviour Christ, my God, my Lord, thy cross shall be my sign. The Lord can give repentance to the most unlikely, turning lions into lambs, and ravens into doves. Let us look to him that this great change may be wrought in us. Assuredly the contemplation of the death of Christ is one of the surest and speediest methods of gaining repentance. Do not sit down and try to pump up repentance from the dry well of a corrupt nature. It is contrary to the laws of mind to suppose that you can force your soul into a gracious state. Take your heart in prayer to him who understands it, and say, Lord, cleanse it, Lord, renew it, Lord, work repentance in it. The more you try to produce penitent emotions in yourself, the more you will be disappointed. But if you believingly think of Jesus dying for you, repentance will burst forth. Meditate on the Lord's shedding his heart's blood out of love to you. Set before your mind's eye the agony and bloody sweat, the cross and passion, and, as you do this, he who was the bearer of all this grief will look at you, and with that look he will do for you what he did for Peter, so that you also will go out and weep bitterly. He who died for you can, by his gracious spirit, make you die to sin, and he who has gone into glory on your behalf can draw your soul after him, away from evil, and toward holiness. I shall be content if I leave this one thought with you. Look not beneath the ice to find fire, neither hope in your own natural heart to find repentance. Look to the living one for life. Look to Jesus for all you need between hell-gate and heaven-gate. Never seek elsewhere for any part of that which Jesus loves to bestow. But remember, Christ is all. THE FEAR OF FINAL FALLING A dark fear haunts the minds of many who are coming to Christ. They are afraid that they shall not persevere to the end. I have heard the seeker say, If I were to cast my soul upon Jesus, yet peradventure I should after draw back into perdition. 
I have had good feelings before now, and they have died away. My goodness has been as the morning cloud and as the early dew. It has come on a sudden, lasted for a season, promised much, and then vanished away. I believe that this fear is often the father of the fact, and that some who have been afraid to trust Christ for all time, and for all eternity, have failed because they had a temporary faith, which never went far enough to save them. They set out trusting to Jesus in a measure, but looking to themselves for continuance and perseverance in the heavenward way, and so they set out faultily, and, as a natural consequence, turned back before long. If we trust to ourselves for our holding on, we shall not hold on. Even though we rest in Jesus for a part of our salvation, we shall fail if we trust to self for anything. No chain is stronger than its weakest link. If Jesus be our hope for everything, except one thing, we shall utterly fail, because in that one point we shall come to naught. I have no doubt whatever that a mistake about the perseverance of the saints has prevented the perseverance of many who did run well. What did hinder them that they should not continue to run? They trusted to themselves for that running, and so they stopped short. Beware of mixing even a little of self with the mortar with which you build, or you will make it untempered mortar, and the stones will not hold together. If you look to Christ for your beginnings, beware of looking to yourself for your endings. He is Alpha. See to it that you make him Omega also. If you begin in the Spirit, you must not hope to be made perfect by the flesh. Begin as you mean to go on, and go on as you began, and let the Lord be all in all to you. Oh, that God, the Holy Spirit, may give us a very clear idea of where the strength must come from by which we shall be preserved until the day of our Lord's appearing. Here is what Paul once said upon this subject when he was writing to the Corinthians. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom ye were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This language silently admits a great need, by telling us how it is provided for. Wherever the Lord makes a provision, we are quite sure that there was a need for it, since no superfluities encumber the covenant of grace. Golden shields hung in Solomon's courts which were never used, but there are none such in the armory of God. What God has provided we shall surely need. Between this hour and the consummation of all things, every promise of God and every provision of the covenant of grace will be brought into requisition. The urgent need of the believing soul is confirmation, continuance, final preservation, preservation to the end. This is the great necessity of the most advanced believers. For Paul was writing to saints at Corinth, who were men of a high order, of whom he could say, I thank my God always on your behalf, for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Such men are the very persons who most assuredly feel that they have daily need of new grace if they are to hold on, and hold out, and come off conquerors at the last. If you were not saints, you would have no grace, and you would feel no need of more grace. But because you are men of God, therefore you feel the daily demands of the spiritual life. The marble statue requires no food, but the living man hungers and thirsts, and he rejoices that his bread and water are made sure to him, for else he would certainly faint by the way. The believer's personal wants make it inevitable that he should daily draw from the great source of all supplies, for what could he do if he could not resort to his God? This is true of the most gifted of the saints, of those men at Corinth who were enriched with all utterance and with all knowledge. They needed to be confirmed to the end, or else their gifts and attainments would prove their ruin. If we had the tongues of men and of angels, if we did not receive fresh grace, where should we be? If we had all experienced till we were fathers in the church, if we had been taught of God so as to understand all mysteries, yet we could not live a single day without the divine life flowing into us from our covenant head. How could we hope to hold on for a single hour, to say nothing of a lifetime, unless the Lord should hold us on? He who began the good work in us must perform it unto the day of Christ, or it will prove a painful failure. This great necessity arises very much from our own selves. 
In some there is a painful fear that they shall not persevere in grace because they know their own fickleness. Certain persons are constitutionally unstable. Some men are by nature conservative, not to say obstinate, but others are as naturally variable and volatile. Like butterflies they flit from flower to flower, till they visit all the beauties of the garden, and settle upon none of them. They are never long enough in one place to do any good, not even in their business nor in their intellectual pursuits. Such persons may well be afraid that ten, twenty, thirty, forty, perhaps fifty years of continuous religious watchfulness will be a great deal too much for them. We see men joining first one church and then another, till they box the compass. They are everything by turns, and nothing long. Such have double need to pray that they may be divinely confirmed, and may be made not only steadfast, but unmovable, or otherwise they will not be found always abounding in the work of the Lord. All of us, even if we have no constitutional temptation to fickleness, must feel our own weakness if we are really quickened of God. Dear reader, do you not find enough in any one single day to make you stumble? You that desire to walk in perfect holiness, as I trust you do, you that have set before you a high standard of what a Christian should be, do you not find that before the breakfast things are cleared away from the table, you have displayed enough folly to make you ashamed of yourselves? If we were to shut ourselves up in the lone cell of a hermit, temptation would follow us. For as long as we cannot escape from ourselves, we cannot escape from incitements to sin. There is that within our heart which should make us watchful and humble before God. If He does not confirm us, we are so weak that we shall stumble and fall, not overturned by an enemy, but by our own carelessness. Lord, be Thou our strength, we are weakness itself. Besides that, there is the weariness which comes of a long life. When we begin our Christian profession we mount up with wings as eagles, further on we run without weariness, but in our best and truest days we walk without fainting. Our pace seems slower, but it is more serviceable and better sustained. I pray God that the energy of our youth may continue with us so far as it is the energy of the Spirit, and not the mere fermentation of proud flesh. He that has long been on the road to heaven finds that there was good reason why it was promised that his shoes should be iron and brass, for the road is rough. He has discovered that there are hills of difficulty and valleys of humiliation, that there is a veil of death-shade, and worse still, a vanity fair and that all these are to be traversed. If there be delectable mountains, and, thank God, there are, there are also castles of despair, the inside of which pilgrims have too often seen. Considering all things, those who hold out to the end in the way of holiness will be men wondered at. O oh, world of wonders, I can say no less. The days of a Christian's life are like so many coenours of mercy threaded upon the golden string of divine faithfulness. In heaven we shall tell to angels and principalities and powers the unsearchable riches of Christ which were spent upon us and enjoyed by us while we were here below. We have been kept alive on the brink of death. Our spiritual life has been a flame burning on in the midst of the sea, a stone that has remained suspended in the air. It will amaze the universe to see us enter the pearly gate, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to be full of grateful wonder if kept for an hour, and I trust we are. If this were all, there would be enough cause for anxiety, but there is far more. We have to think of what a place we live in. The world is a howling wilderness to many of God's people. Some of us are greatly indulged in the providence of God but others have a stern fight of it. We begin our day with prayer, and we hear the voice of holy song full often in our houses, but many good people have scarcely risen from their knees in the morning before they are saluted with blasphemy. They go out to work, all day long they are vexed with filthy conversation like righteous lot in Sodom. Can you even walk the open streets without your ears being afflicted with foul language? The world is no friend to grace. The best we can do with this world is to get through it as quickly as we can, for we dwell in an enemy's country. A robber lurks in every bush. Everywhere we travel with a drawn sword in our hand, or at least with that weapon which is called all prayer ever at our side. 
for we have to contend for every inch of our way. Make no mistake about this, or you will be rudely shaken out of your fond delusion. O oh God, help us, and confirm us to the end, or where shall we be? True religion is supernatural at its beginning, supernatural in its continuance, and supernatural in its close. It is the work of God from first to last. There is great need that the hand of the Lord should be stretched out still. That need my reader is feeling now and I am glad that he should feel it, for now he will look for his own preservation to the Lord who alone is able to keep us from falling, and glorify us with his Son. End of section 10